An unusual disease caused by an annoying hobby. And then we take a look at the alien abduction of Johnny Sands. Who's Johnny Sands, you ask? Why, he's the most rootinous, tootinous alien abduction victim you'll ever meet. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Chase Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I'm sweaty. I'm just a puddle of sweat. And just think about it, a year ago today was the day before Dead Rabbit Radio started. I still don't know if I'm going to do anything special for tomorrow's episode, because I kind of did my look back episode for the New Year's Eve episode, and I thought that, I don't, I don't think I can do another one six months later. The last six months have kind of been a blur. The first six months was pretty rough, and the last six months, they've been kind of rough too, but it just kind of flew by. And I've had a lot of good stories, but I haven't had a lot of bad, like that first retrospective I was able to say, like, this is my least favorite episode. Here's some of the drama that was happening behind the scenes. We haven't had anything like that since, which is good. I haven't had an episode that I've recorded in the past six months that I've been like, this episode sucks. I've I've had episodes I've recorded that I've re-recorded, and it's just funny because that's part of the thing of becoming skill i don't think i'm the, i'm sure i could do much better at this than i am doing but through practice i can be recording something and i i'll go this isn't working in the past i would have just released the episode because i wouldn't know if it was working i would just been like oh that was great jason you talked for a half hour episode's done but now when i record stuff as i'm recording it i can go this isn't working for whatever reason then i gotta like re-record it but even that doesn't happen as often so Within a year, I think I've come a long way skill-wise. There's still a lot of stuff I want to work on, but uh, yeah. I mean, that's it. I, I don't. There wasn't any craziness that's happened in the past six months other than the stuff that we cover on the show. Let's go ahead and actually get started with our first story. Now, for our first story, we are going to England. The year is 2014, so not too long ago. There's an old man, actually not that old, he's only 62 years old. That's old to you if you're young. When you're 42, that's not old anymore. But there's a 62-year-old man laying in a bed in Britain. Uh, uh. And they're like, old man whose name we can't disclose because of medical (laughs) privacy laws. Just hang on a little bit longer. Uh, I can't. There's a scientist, doctor dude, <laughs> doing stuff in another laboratory. Doctor's, like, going over these readings and stuff like that. And he's like, I got it. I know what's making him sick. So he's running through the hospital. Get out of the way, nurses. Move out of the way, burn victims. I got a person to tell something to. Because it's too late to actually save this person. This person is eventually going to die. But the scientist doctor kicks in the door and goes, I got it. I know what's killing you. And he's like, thanks a lot. Is is there a cure? And they're like, no, no, there's no cure. But I thought you would want to know what killed you. And he's like, uh, I'd, re- I'd rather have a cure. So this man who they haven't named, we'll, we'll, we'll call him Seamus. We'll call him Seamus. And the reason will become clear in a second. So Seamus, in 2009, he was diagnosed with this thing called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I know how to say pneumonia. This had a couple extra little vowels on the end of it. Hypersensitivity pneumitis. And what happens is this horrible lung disease where you're basically like getting in mold and stuff into your lungs. And it's causing your immune system to, to basically attack your own body. So it just completely scars up the inner sides. The inner side. It completely scars up the insides of your lungs. So this gross little, like, it's basically, remember that movie, Osmosis Jones? That, but it's a horror movie. They're crawling in you, and they're, like, making Osmosis Jones shoot your own lungs. And he's like, I'm doing such a good job, as you're, like, slowly unable to breathe. So Seamus has this disease, and they can't figure out what it is. The doctors are like, okay, well, we know what causes this. It's mold. So let's go to your house. So they go to his house, and they're, like, checking for mold. And they're like, no, there's no mold here. Do you keep pigeons? Are you a pigeon? (laughs) Is that one of your hobbies is playing with pigeons? And he's like, no. 
I don't like pigeons. Who collects pigeons? I mean, I know my, they don't collect pigeons. They raise pigeons. They're not running around the neighborhood like throwing nets on random pigeons. But I know Mike Tyson plays around with pigeons and stuff like that. It just seems such a like a weird hobby. A pigeon person is the male equivalent. Basically, Mike Tyson's a cat lady, but with birds. So, anyways, he's not a pigeon person. He they they go. Do you do you have any birds around you? Because bird poop can also cause this disease. And he's like, no, I don't. And they're like, do you smoke? This guy didn't smoke. He didn't smoke. His lungs are grossly inflamed. The doctors don't even like doing tests on him anymore because they look so gross. But this guy's not getting any better. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go on a trip. I'm going to go on a trip, and I'm going to leave this hobby behind. And the doctors are like, what hobby? He's like, oh, no, no, I'll tell you about that hobby later. This hobby I'll, I'll leave behind. I'm going to Australia for three months. And the doctor's like, okay, hope you feel better. And they're just kind of like, that poor sap, he's not going to feel better. He goes to Australia, feels great. Gets better, actually. Starts to recover from this horrible, horrible disease. Can breathe again. Comes back, starts his hobby back up, and immediately gets worse. Eventually gets to the point that he can't walk more than 65 feet without having to sit down and Take a break. That's how much he couldn't breathe. And the doctors the whole time could not figure out what it was. But the doctors the whole time, although they did check his house for mold, and they did check his bird his bird cages, make sure he had none, wasn't hanging out with a bunch of pigeons on the roof, they did notice he had quite an odd and annoying hobby. It was playing the bagpipes. Every day. He played the bagpipes. He had this really nice bagpipe, and it ha- it was a synthetic bag. Now, the old bagpipes had leather bags that every day you had to treat the leather to keep it loose. But as technology has moved on, people have moved on to the synthetic bags. So you don't have to do that. I mean, you're, you're recommended to clean them, but you don't have to do this daily treatment for them. He played the bagpipes every single day until he went to Australia for three months, didn't bring his bagpipe with him, got better, came back to the UK, first plane lands, he unpacks his bags, he's like, oh, I've missed you, honey, as he's hugging the bagpipe, starts playing it again, gets worse. Now, it wasn't until he was basically on his deathbed that the doctor said, hmm, let's look in the bagpipe, it's full of mold, it was super gross, it was basically his lungs in a portable form. Which technically, his lungs are portable because they're moving around with him. But you know what I mean? Like, what was in his lungs was in this bagpipe. So he's blowing into the bagpipe all these years. And he probably cleaned it out occasionally, but not as much as you would need to. Because the synthetic bag just holds all that gross, disgusting. Can you imagine how gross that uh, cut open that? I'm getting kind of sick just thinking about it. Cutting open a bagpipe bag and just seeing all like that growth and bacteria from him spitting into it for years. Whether he cleaned it once a year or he didn't clean it all, enough stuff, gross stuff, was able to breed in there. All of his breath and wet, liquidy mouth stuff. Saliva is the word I'm looking for. Hanging out in here, growing civilizations rise and fall within his bagpipe bag as bacteria and mold just conquered that whole Basically, to them, that was their universe. So, but, but then some of them decided to start a space program and flew into his mouth. And then he became colonized as well. So he did pass away. And this has now been called bagpipe lung. And they've had to warn people, specifically people who use synthetic bagpipe bags, clean them as often as you can because otherwise you can have some horrible, horrible problems. But let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Now, our next story here is going to take us to the magical, magical year of 1976. The year I was born. So, in 1976, in January, it's a cold Vegas night. Let's go to Las Vegas, guys. Heading out to Las Vegas, city that never sleeps. Little tiny town in the middle of Nevada. Basically, one long strip. I've been there a couple times. I think I've only been there once. But technically, I took an airplane, so I flew out of there, and then I came back. I've been to Reno quite a lot, but Las Vegas is just like a big road with a bunch of shiny buildings on it. I don't know. I saw it in Con Air and Casino. So, or did Casino take place in Reno? It doesn't matter. The point is, is that we're in Las Vegas. Gambling mecca of the world. 
we're in a car. We're actually going to be in the car with this dude. We're all crowded into the back. It's me, you, and Johnny Sands. Now, Johnny Sands, you don't know who he is. I had to look him up because I didn't know who he is, but he knows who he is. He's an up-and-coming country musician. Now, a little spoiler alert, the fact that this story takes place in 1976 and you don't know who this guy is should tell you the, the trajectory of his career. But in 1976, the whole world was open to Johnny Sands. Native American kid turns into country western singer, actually made his bones doing stunt work for western shows, and now he is out to make his career as a country western singer. He's getting ready to release his first album. He's in Vegas doing a couple shows and doing radio spots for his album. But this night, he's just driving through Vegas. Just driving through the desert to get to Vegas or to leave Vegas. The, basically, the whole place is one big desert. You can turn down an alleyway and all of a sudden, you're in shrubs. It's a horrible, horrible hellscape. But he's driving through the desert and he sees a blimp overhead. And, you know, whatever. Like, I'm always fascinated by blimps. I mean, at least for the first two minutes, I see one and then I just go back to doing whatever I was doing. But they are kind of fascinating air vehicles. But in 1976, whatever, he's like, it's not 1932, this isn't the World's Fair, I've seen a blimp before. He sees a blimp, doesn't really pay it any mind. He has moves to make, he's got stuff to do. But as the blimp gets closer overhead, it's behind him, his car starts to die, and he's like, Dag nabbit, oh man, I know I should have gotten the extended warranty on this car, because now what I'm going to do, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and my car is broken down, and he gets out of the car. And he goes over and he's like checking the gas tank. He's like, kick it. I read this in multiple articles. It says that Johnny Sands kicked the car so he can hear if the gas was swashing around in the gas tank. I'm thinking, who is this guy? The Hulk? How can you kick a car so hard that you actually hear liquid inside of it moving? Two articles said he kicked the car. It's like, that's okay. So right there, I was a little suspicious of his story. I've never, I've heard of kicking the tires before, but I've never heard someone go, hey, how much gas do you have in your car? And then a dude just goes, Arr! he goes, a quarter of a tank. So anyways, Johnny Sands, he's able to kick his car hard enough to determine he does have gas in his tank. He then goes to work on his engine because he's like, well, I, I kicked the car. So that's not the problem. And he's like kicking the hood open. He's like doing, he's punching the engine. He's like, I don't know why these spark plugs aren't working. But as all that's going on, we're just sitting in the car. We're not helping this dude. We're actually a little scared because when he kicked the car with us in it, I felt the liquids in my own body move. I go, oh, my God, I drank too much water today. Got to go bathroom now. So as he's working on the car, though, he realizes that the vehicle has now passed overhead. And it's not a blimp. It's not a blimp. Now, we knew it wasn't a blimp because this is a story from the intro about a UFO abduction, but... He still sees it as like a disc type shape. Flies overhead. And he notices that it seems to have uh, windows on the side. And it has and it has red and white lights flashing on each end. And it, that's a funny detail. When I read that, I thought that's something that a earthbound ship does. Red and white lights. Like that's something you see on basically every plane. So that made me think, whoa, this might have been a U.S. vehicle. But it's just the red and white lights is such a, a mundane detail. It was also a rusty orange color. Now, Johnny Sands is quite the colorful character. He's basically a down-home country boy. And so it makes sense that his UFO encounter, he sees it the color of a beat-up Ford truck. Rusty orange UFO. That is basically the General Lee. That is basically like a trailer park truck color. His UFO encounter is with this thing. And he flies overhead and he's like, oh, whoa, that's kind of cool. But he goes back to working on his car because he really wants to get out of there. And he's still thinking it's a blimp. But at that point, his headlights turn on. And he kicks the hood shut and starts to walk back into the car. But he's paralyzed. He can't move. But before he gets paralyzed, sorry, I forgot this part. Before he gets paralyzed, he turns and looks down the desert road when the headlights came back on. The, The headlights come back on. He looks down the road and then he's like. Better get back in my car. Now, now he gets paralyzed. And as he's paralyzed, he sees these two humanoids walking towards him from the craft. So he said he has the, the, the aliens, like one of them stayed farther back, but one of them approached him. 
And he described him as having the body of like a young, fit man. Like just like a... Nowadays, we'd say, you know, he had the body of Ryan Reynolds. This alien had the body of Ryan Reynolds. Young, fit man. Back then, he would have said the guy had the body of... of who's the dude with the big mustache? Not Magnum P.I. Uh, not Bruce Willis, because he he's never had a mustache. He was Burt Reynolds, Burt Reynolds. So imagine this alien with a burly Burt Reynolds body, because it's 1976. That was young and fit back then. Nowadays, that's like monstrous man. Who? Why aren't there big actors anymore? Why are all the actors super like lean? Like even the muscular ones are super lean. Whatever happened to the Schwarzeneggers and the Stallones? They got replaced by the Jean Claudes. Like we need another like giant action star. Maybe not even action star. We just need like a giant. Even if he's in a romantic comedy, not like Andre the Giant Giant, but we need more buff actors. I want equal representation. <laughs> As a possibly buff man myself someday, I want to see my future self represented in the movies. Get to it, Hollywood. We need more buff men. So, anyway, that aside, Burt Reynolds' body. But, Johnny Sands says this about the alien's head. This is interesting. Exact quote. But in his face, facial structure, I don't know. Something gave me the idea that this guy was uh, 300 or 400 years old was very powerful face. Not ugly. Powerful looking. And that's kind of interesting. He goes on a couple times in his descriptions. He talks about, I know what powerful looks like. When he goes into like, he's like, listen, I grew up on a reservation. I've been around people who are like spiritually touched and knew things greater than I could ever hope to know. And that's what these aliens look like. They just looked like they had the secrets to the universe in them. They look powerful powerful and you're like okay john calm down calm down dude powerful one of these articles actually is just a straight interview with him and it's a hoot but so he's saying that they they looked like these adonises from the neck down but they're and he's saying they weren't ugly they just looked so knowledgeable they looked ancient but they also did kind of have wrinkles and stuff like that this is how he described them they were bald they were they were tall too they were his height and they were bald no eyelash. There was no facial hair whatsoever. So no eyelashes, no brows, no whiskers, nothing. Now, they wore uh, black skin-tight suits, like uh, basically unitards, from the wrist all the way down to the ankles. And I've, as I've been looking into more alien abduction stuff, it's so bizarre. Almost all of them that wear unitards, almost all aliens wear unitards. I wonder how come there's no aliens wearing togas. Does it have something to do with the way that they travel? Or is it just an easy detail to make up if you're making up a story? I don't know. But there has to be some reason why they're always wearing these unitards. But he said that the suit was skin-tight black. So he could see their perfectly carved Burt Reynolds muscles. He could see each hair pressed up against the tight, tight suit. He said that it looked smooth, but when he touched it, because at one point one of them brushed up against him, uh-huh, Johnny was, like, trying to make the moves on this dude. The alien's like, stop it. But No, we come in peace. Get your hands off me. He grabbed, he touched, he didn't grab, sorry. He brushed up against the alien, and the suit felt like sandpaper. So even though it looked super smooth, it actually was quite coarse. All of this going on, they had black eyes with white pupils, so little, little, uh, inhuman eyes, something you don't normally see, a flattened nose, a small mouth, a little slit mouth, that didn't move when they spoke. So these ones are, again, working on some sort of telepathy type stuff. And, a very interesting detail, they had gills. They had little gills on the side of their neck that would constantly move. Constantly move. So basically, fish gills... Maybe like farther up, like on the head area, but they were basically very visible there. And, but they still had a nose and a mouth and all that stuff. So there's this whole thing where they're basically asking him, like, what are you doing here? They ask him, what are you doing here? Even though they just flew over in their Chevy pickup, landed, paralyzed him, and they go, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm here promoting a music album. It just, the dude is so down to earth. Like, assuming this story is true, he's meeting extraterrestrials for the first time, and they go, it'd be the equivalent of someone goes, take me to your leader, and he's like, Trump, you want to know about Trump? Why he's making America great again. You better come on down. Come into the White House. Like, just instead of just being like, whoa, 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 wait a second, you're aliens? He just goes into his sales pitch. 
They go, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I'm in Vegas to sell my album. You know, I'm a country singer and I got stuff to do. I got moves to make. I got moves to make. And you're sitting here. You're busting my car. I got to go. I don't know why he had a New York accent all of a sudden. But anyways, and he said, I I said that. I didn't go off in that whole monologue that Jason just made up. But he did say, I'm a country western singer. I'm here promoting an album. And he says, the aliens acted like they understood what I was talking about. Like, that they understood what a country singer was and things like that. It was so odd. Now, he doesn't reveal a lot of what these aliens say. Because they told him, don't tell anyone what we talk about. He did ask them questions like, are you with the military? And they said, no. But for the most part, he doesn't really reveal a lot of stuff about what was said. Now, again, this happened 42 years ago. So... Some of it has come out, but he said, they told me not to say anything. And we'll get to kind of a loophole in that later on. But he's given us just a little bit of the questions. Now, I think what's so funny, so he's meeting these aliens. And when he first meets these aliens, because again, this is 1976. So we've had UFO culture around for about 20 years at this point. You had all the movies and you had all the stories of these little green men and all this stuff. He says this. This is one of his great quotes. Well, I'm not discriminating nobody because I'm not wanting to say that I'm the only man who has seen somebody from outer space. But I do have a little bit of a problem with some of the stories that I hear because I don't think those little balloony shaped head people with green dotted eyes and crawl around and look like piss ants. I think their intelligence is far beyond that look. They're not three foot high. These people I seen were intelligent people. You could see wisdom in their face. You could see that strength in them. Now, I know there was like three different accents during that dramatic reading, but he brings up an interesting point. So he's saying from his point, if you listen, I'm not, I'm going to have to translate Hillbilly now. I'm not saying I'm the only person who's ever seen an alien before, but every description I've ever heard of an alien is wrong because that's not what I saw at all. And, and even if aliens did look like that, it doesn't make sense because aliens seem to be so much smarter and so much more advanced than us, and they look like piss ants. They look like tiny little people. So anyways, he ends up bidding the aliens adieu. And that's just the beginning of his adventure. He ends up talking to the government. He, he like, mentions it at a news conference or something like that. He ends up, like, mentioning it at a news conference or mentioning it to a reporter, and then he gets connected with this aerospace lab in Nevada. And they tell him, then he tells the story again, and I'm sure they all just thought it was super amusing. They tell him to contact the government. He contacts the government, and they want to do like a lie detector test on him and interview him. And at one point, he he says, I have an album to publicize. And this is actually not good publicity for me. Because everyone's just going to think I'm a big old kook. Buy my album? You want to buy my album, General? And the guy's like, fine. If I buy your album, will you take a lie detector test? And he's like, if you buy 10 albums, I might. Everyone on the base is having to buy a copy of an album. He does take a lie detector test. He quote-unquote passes, which basically means he wasn't being deceitful. I mean, the thing, lie detector tests are always, it doesn't necessarily mean you're telling the truth. It just means that in your mind, what you're saying is true. But while they're doing all this stuff, they bring in a guy to do a sketch of the alien, described as the best artist in Vegas. So I'm assuming it was a velvet artist. The guy had just completed Velvet Elvis, and now he's doing Velvet Dogs Playing Poker. He's brought in by the government to do Velvet Alien. And as the best artist in Vegas is doing this, and Johnny Sands is like, yeah, and then the guy, he he was bold, he was bold, but he had Burt Reynolds' body. And they're like, oh, that's interesting, I can draw that pretty easily. And Johnny goes, and he had gills, he had gills, and the artist starts drawing it, and he goes, why does he have gills if he has an ear and a nose? Now remember, this is in a government area. The government's getting the artist to come out here and do all this stuff. As the artist goes, why does he have gills if he has a mouth and a nose? A member of uh, like an attache, there's like a government observer there. He goes, the reason why he has gills, it's an evolutionary thing. They're from a planet from the Sirius star system that's half water, half land. And so as the water tides move across the planet, sometimes they have to be underwater when it's super hot. Sometimes they have to be on land. They're kind of like a frog, an amphibious race of aliens. So that basically meant that this, this guy knew what these aliens were. And the artist goes, uh... Now, imagine you're sitting there. You had just seen an alien. You thought it might have been a one-off thing. You asked him these questions. 
you're in a government meeting, a guy goes, oh no, we totally are aware of that race. They're an amphibious race. We know where they're at. We know why they're like that. How would you react to that? Johnny Sands goes, well, I don't know, but that sounds good to me. That's his exact quote. This guy, now you realize why UFOs always land in the middle of Arkansas. Because if this is your most credible witness, a guy just tells you that they have knowledge of an alien civilization on another planet. And what you saw is verifiably true to the point we know why they evolved that way. And you're like, oh, shucks. Anyways, so eventually he says, Johnny goes, listen, things did start getting a little weird. So I have an old cop buddy. I have an old cop buddy who has an incredibly colorful backstory. He's like, he fought Muhammad Ali. He, just, he fought Joe Frazier. But anyways, he was just super weird. Johnny Sands, I don't, I, I, again, I have a hard time buying into a lot of this stuff. Johnny Sands calls up his cop friend. He goes, things are getting a little weird out here. I could probably use a bodyguard. And then a local television producer named Dave Dunn was like, hey, we're going to do a show about this blimp flying overhead, but we're going to make it really low budget because we don't have a lot of money, but we're going to drive out to the desert. You show us where it's at. We're going to shoot this show. And Johnny's like, fine, but I'm going to bring my bodyguard with me. And Dave's like, yeah, sure. They all get into a, like two cars. They drive out there together. And Johnny goes, this is the place where the lights are at. And the car just keeps driving. And Johnny's like, no, no, no. It was back there where we were supposed to stop. And the car keeps driving. Pro tip, if you're ever in a car in Vegas and you say, hey, I'm supposed to get out here. And it keeps going further into the desert. It's not going to be a good ending for you. But for this story, the first car stops, everyone gets out. The second car stops, everyone but Johnny and his bodyguard get out. They're told to stay in the car. And all these bright lights appear around the cars. And Johnny's like, I'm going to go find out what's going on because this is dumb. Like, I need to find out what's going on. And he notices, like, Dave is, like, talking to someone who's obscured by the lights and keeps pointing at the car with Johnny Sands and his bodyguard in it. And they roll down the window a bit, and he they hear Dave Dunn goes, What are we supposed to do? He knows too much. He knows too much. And they're like, Uh oh, this is not good. And at that point, Johnny Sands is like, I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna give him an old one two from a country boy. And as he goes to open the this is so as he goes to open the door to get out to confront the men behind these bright lights in the middle of the Las Vegas desert, he describes two Two of these big, like, just balls of fur. They're, like, three feet tall, giant balls of hair, like Cousin It from the Adams Family, come running out of the desert and slam against the car and hold the door shut so he can't get out. So now he's in the car with his bodyguard. He's looking at these two big balls of hair looking at him through the window. And the bodyguard goes, are you still going to get out? And the most sensible thing Johnny Sands has done since the beginning of this, he said, no, I'm just going to stay in the car. And then eventually the furry people left. And Dave Dunn gets in the car, and the cars just drive back, drop him off at the hotel. The next day, when Johnny and his bodyguard went to Dave Dunn's production office to find out what the hell happened the night last night, because no one said anything on their way back, who the furry people were, what was going on, they go to the production office they had been to multiple times throughout the course of this. Whole, that that Dave Dunn story was actually like quite like weeks long. They go to the production office no one's there it's been completely cleaned out and the woman who rented the office out said no one has no one's been in there for a while dun 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 dave dunn that producer died a thousand years ago dun, dun. it was this weird like he says that dave dunn was basically one of the men in black and they were trying to figure out what to do with him but what's weird about that story is they should have taken care of him months ago because he'd already spread the story all over the place so where are we at now with the saga of johnny sands Johnny Sands has done interviews since. He basically says the men in black, the guys who were doing the Dave Dunn and all that stuff, one of the first things they wanted me to do was write a song about the aliens. Write it in one day. Had to hurry up and write a song. And I did. I never released it. And then I feel like all of the stuff the aliens told me has kind of passed the statute of limitations. Like enough time has passed. I think I can do it. So I am right. I'm going to release my song about the aliens. I'm going to spread their message to the world. And you can find it on my website, myspace.com slash Johnny Sands Music. With this album, we can finally have the message out about the aliens. It's time. It's time to let you guys know what they said. The interview kind of wrapped up with the interviewer saying, you know, do you ever like think about, do you still think about this? And Johnny Sands is like, all the time. Sometimes I just walk out of my house. 
I throw my hands up into the air. I look up at the sky and say, Come back, friends. Come back, I want to talk to you. Now, that's a kind of a common thing we've seen with other alien encounter stories in the past. People, like, want to reach out and touch someone. But, of course, your main question is, Jason, you listen to the music, right? You found some of Johnny Sands' stuff. You listen to this alien song, right, for this story. It's gone. Deleted? Lost? Who knows? Johnny Sands' music is still up on MySpace page. There's absolutely no songs listed there. The only song I can find of him was some honky-tonk song about Elvis. There's always that saying, they should have sent a poet. I think they're specifically talking about going to space for the first time. They said they should have sent a poet, because that person could really use the language to explain the beauty of what is going on. And whether or not you enjoy country music, Johnny Sands is a poet. He uses his words to create art and to evoke emotions. How many times do we have artists encounter aliens? It's not very often. Not very often at all. So when one does, I think it's fascinating in his narrative that the men in black have him write a song about what he went through. Very shortly, too. They didn't want him to overthink it. They just wanted him to put it out there right now. Just write it. And he wrote it and he performed it for him. And I'm sure he made them buy his cassette. But where is that song now? Was it just another rinky-dink tune from a guy who tried making it as a country western singer and never really lived up to that potential? Or did that song contain truths? Artists are immortalized by their work. Whether or not you're a famous artist or an obscure artist, what you create is your legacy. Johnny Sands' legacy is just a few interviews now. A few MP3s floating around the internet and a dead page on MySpace. But the song that he wrote on orders of a shady governmental organization is part of his legacy as well. We may not be able to hear it, but this song that included first impressions of an alien encounter written by a poet may be in some government archive somewhere, just filed away with a little tag on it, Sands, comma, Johnny, Desert Encounter, 1976. We'll never be able to hear that song, but hopefully Johnny found some peace knowing that he became one of the most famous musicians in the world of UFOs. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Hey.